Okay, so I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, continuous delivery. Um, it's actually a topic I'm quite excited about, so I'm worried that I will either talk really fast and be over in 20 minutes, or I'll talk forever and you guys will never get out of here. So I'll try to keep an eye on the time. Actually, I'm going to reset this so I, I can see my time running here. Okay. So just to give you a big picture of what our team is working on. So I work on a team, I kind of have two hats on. I work, I'm a co-lead of the Eclipse Orion project, but I'm also a member of a team that builds for uh, Bluemix, which is a cloud platform provided by IBM, which I'm not going to go into detail, but just to give you the context of what we're doing, um, we have the Orion uh, web IDE, and we also have some Eclipse tooling, and we actually have a whole uh, pipeline of development tools that are for Bluemix. So we actually have a uh, planning tool, Git hosting, uh, um, a Jenkins build pipeline. There's a whole suite of different tools and a lot of different teams working on it. And we're just one little piece of this, the, the web IDE part. So I'm going to be talking mostly about my team, but kind of in the context of this really big uh, development tool chain that we're building uh, as part of a larger team. So just to give you an idea of the, the scale, it's about 60 developers working on the tooling side, a couple hundred working on the runtime side. It's quite a, quite a large organization overall. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting uh, large group to try to coordinate. So when we started out on, on these development tools, we, most of us came from a background of kind of the Eclipse model of annual releases, maybe every four months, you know, do an update. Uh, so for the first while we were, we were um, sort of planning on four month lease cycles. Um, uh, but we had, um, it, it was fairly painful. So when you, when you go off and develop for three or four months and then try to deploy a new version of a SaaS product that users are actually using, it's very jarring for the users. Um, and it's very painful to get those deployments out when it's such a huge amount of change coming out all at once. Um, so it was a pretty painful experience when we were starting out with this um, in getting our, our code out to the customers in a seamless way. Um, there were some things that we were doing pretty well from the beginning. So right at the start of this, we had uh, three different um, identical environments set up. So we had a dev, a dev instance of our whole tool server, uh, a QA or testing instance, and then a production server, all configured absolutely identically, uh, which is a really important principle for DevOps uh, practices where you have an environment exactly like production from day one. So we did that pretty well. Trying to do automation, but it was kind of sticks and stones automation. It was a lot of shell scripts. Um, and often a deploy would involve, you know, invoking a half dozen shell scripts and hoping you don't make any typos. Uh, so it was, you know, we were trying to be on the right path and automating, but we were, um, we were not, you know, it was still pretty rough ride. Um, and we were using dark launches, which is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a concept that most um, software developers are familiar with, maybe under different names, like feature toggles. So the idea is you actually get the, get a new feature into your code base, but it's invisible for the customer. And, you know, like in the Eclipse world, it might be some preference or some system property or an INI configuration that would turn it on. Uh, so the same idea here is you deploy a feature that's in the code base, it's in the live product that the users could use, but it's turned off and there has to be, and there's some way that you can turn it on. And that's a really good way to get the integration pain over with um, before dealing with the pain of the customer actually experiencing it. And it's a way to get early feedback from, from keen adopters. So that's one thing we were doing pretty well at the beginning. Um, but we're under a lot of pressure to move faster. So we were doing, we were kind of doing monthly deploys. Like we were, you know, had this three or four month release cycle and every month we'd, we'd have to deploy for some reason or other. Uh, so there's lots of business pressures to deliver more frequently. Um, customers and users, you know, we're all spoiled by the, uh, the mobile uh, transformation that's happened in, in computing where people expect, you know, people are used to smartphones and tablets, really expect apps to upgrade seamlessly and frequently. You know, you expect the apps on your phone or like every time I pluck up my phone or tablet, you can see updating, updating, you know, it's installing new versions of things, very low friction seamlessly, but it's very frequent releases. So a lot of customers begin to expect that. And when they ask for something and we say, you know, come back in two years, um, that's not a very satisfying answer, right? So a lot of pressure to deliver new fixes. There's also, you know, things like security uh, issues. So there'll be uh, 
at least every couple months there's some kind of zero day exploit where we've got to get a fix out to some piece of our middleware or application really fast, right? So zero days mean um, the big vendors kind of get a, a 24 hour advance notice before some security exploit is published to the world and we have one day to get our fix out before it's available to, to all, the, all the hackers out there. So those are very tight timelines that we have to get deploys out fast. Um, but then there's also a lot of technology pressures. So if you, when you're building an app for the web or even for, for mobile, it is a fast, you, it's not a static world. Your app is not living in a static world. Um, you, you know, if you release every six months, but all the pieces around you ship every, every six weeks, uh, like if you're running in the browser, every six weeks there's a new version of Chrome and Firefox, it might break your app. So you've got to be ready to react to it. So there's a lot of pressure on the technology side to be, to be able to move at least as fast as all, all your dependencies. And that means you know, the mobile platform if you're doing mobile or, or, or browser platform if you're, if you're developing for the web. So, so what do we do? So we got this really painful deploy process um, and we want, we're being asked to do it a lot more often, right? So we're, we're killing ourselves and we want to kill, they, you know, we're being asked to kill ourselves every week instead of every, every month. Um, so I, I actually love this quote from no, none other than uh, Thomas Watson, one of the early presidents of IBM. You can't control your success rate, but you can control how often you try. Um, so double your failure rate and you'll increase your success rate. Maybe not by double, but you know, you'll, you'll increase it. So we, we consciously said, okay, we're just gonna deploy faster, hit, put our foot on the gas and make ourselves do this and, and feel the pain and try to uh, address the pain and do things better. And that's what, you know, most of my talk is gonna be about the, the kind of things we've learned along the way of doing that and, and what worked well for us and what might, might work well for you if you have a similar, similar challenges. So continuous delivery is actually a, is a buzzword out there now that you'll see. And you know, the definition you'll often see out there is that it's um, continuous delivery means being able to deliver to your customers with, with a click. I mean, that's a bit of a simplification, but you know, we're all used to CI, continuous integration, uh, you know, Jenkins and Hudson, which means um, one click to go from source code through uh, unit testing and build and then it stops, right? Some, typically, that's the early model of CI is it sort of automates your build and your test, and then it leaves it. Uh, so the idea of continuous delivery is you just push that all the way through. So you go, uh, you fully automate the process from source change to on your production server that your customers can see in, in you know, completely automated fashion or as, as automated as possible. And the idea is instead of doing these big bangs every month, which are very jarring for users and very, very challenging for the dev teams, is there's just many little bangs. So lots of little, uh, small batches is a term that's, that's often used. So you, you know, you're actually, when you, when you, if we release, you know, some weeks we release two or three times, um, but it might be uh, one bug fix or six bug fixes or one feature. Um, so it's something that can be done in a very seamless way and it's not very, um, it's not a big interruption for the user and the risk is low, right? The, the risk is kind of proportional to the size of the batch of change you're, you're making. So a lot of, you know, we're technologists and we love to find technology solutions, uh, to these kind of problems. And there is a lot of technology out there to help you with continuous delivery. Um, but it's actually uh, just as important or more important that you, you make cultural change in your organization. Um, the, de the development culture, what um, developers consider to be important, how they interact with each other, how the teams are formed, uh, how your organization operates. Um, you know, there's a lot of cultural aspects to that that you really have to, have to rethink uh, how, you, how you do just about every aspect of your development uh, and work. So, hang on. So it's really uh, instructive to look at, you know, there's a lot of sort of web, born on the web companies that do this kind of thing really well. You know, you think of Google and Amazon and eBay. They've been living this since th their company started. And there's a lot to learn from looking at what they do. And one of the companies that we've been looking at is Spotify, uh, which has a series of, of videos and blogs about their, the, the changes they made to their development culture to do continuous delivery. Um, and we um, have drunk at least a little bit of their Kool-Aid and adopted some of their, some of their ideas. So there's this model of organizing your, your, your development into what they call squads, which are basically each of these vertical bars here is, is, a, is a development team that's fairly autonomous. So the idea is <coughs> you give, a, you give an auto a fairly autonomous development team uh, a mission and they have to execute on that mission and they have a lot of autonomy on how they execute the mission. 
So they're, they're, you give a lot of freedom to the developers to, to on how they organize themselves at the team level, or the squad level. Um, but then you need to, the danger with autonomy is that people go off in different directions, right? So you need to have some kind of alignment across. So there's this notion of chapters where you pull, you know, all the tech from each of the squads together and they get together once in a while and they talk about their practices and make sure they're aligned and the designers from each squad get together and the you know the different kind of roles talk to each other across the squads as well so that you get alignment in, um, in direction but also a fair amount of autonomy day to day so that's a very high level and there's there's a lot of information on the web to to learn more about that so one challenge a uh, big challenge is is keeping developers focused. So, um, you know, we all as developers know what release time feels like. Uh, you know, at the Eclipse Foundation, we had our big 70 million lines of code release. It's very stressful, right? Um, and if you are continuously releasing, it could mean continuous stress, right? And that's actually the first while on our team trying to do this was, was like that. It felt like every release was, every week was release week, which is really a painful thing to live. And one, one, Important thing to address there is making sure developers don't get distracted by that, right? So we, we actually did a survey of our development team to ask them what is distracting you from focus on your feature work. And we kind of expected they're gonna say meetings, same time, uh, instant messaging, um, you know, emails, things like that, but it wasn't. It was actually, so that's what the, the managers and the senior people were facing was, was the meetings and the emails. Uh, but our development teams are actually really good that way. Um, most of our developers on average had two hours or less of meetings a week. So that was not a problem at all. But what was the problem was, was this, the, the big bar there was fighting fires and infrastructure problems. So it's um, not something, a problem with what you're working on right now, but there's something in the live production site. And I've got to turn away from what I'm doing uh, and focus on something else. And that really breaks up the developer's flow and concentration. So. One of the things we've done is create a dedicated squad that is, is called the first responders that whose role is to respond to those putting out fires um, and letting the rest of the squads operate uh, on the new feature work and their, their new development to not get pulled into the, the latest crisis. So that, that's an interesting model that we've adopted that's worked pretty well. And we've also grown a separate squad that's, that's managing the infrastructure and any kind of, um, you know, things like our, our Jenkins build and our, um, uh, our um, metrics infrastructure and many other pieces of our uh, of infrastructure that our developers need but don't want to be constantly pulled into having to fix. So we created a separate squad for that, and it really helped our feature teams focus on doing the feature work that that you know for the customers. So, but the lesson I learned out of that was don't guess what what your developers are, are what their pain points are because uh, you might guess wrong. Uh, go and ask them what you know what's what's in your way of getting your work done. Um, and see, you know, look at what those things are and, and think of ways to address it. So another uh, related to this is, is communication is very important. And it's, it's really, it's all about a balance with communication. If you're communicating too much, basically you're constantly having meetings and emails and instant messaging, um, that's a huge distraction. But if you don't communicate enough um, with these autonomous teams, you can get kind of, they can go off in different directions. They're not aligned on what their mission is. Um, and they might end up you know, developing sort of mistrust and, and bugs happen because of miscommunication between the teams. So getting a, 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 the, just the right amount of communication both within the teams and across the teams is really important. And it's good to look at those two things separately. So within a development squad, development team, um, what are the communication things they need? You know, do they want a daily stand up? Do they want to use um, some of our remote teams use Slack, which is a, a really nice uh, instant messaging client uh, like IRC. Um, some, some of the development teams use Kanban boards, which are basically boards with sticky notes. So there's different communication mechanisms that are appropriate for communication within the team versus communication across the team. And this is something we're constantly trying to consciously think about and tinker with and, and you know, we, we, we basically, there was a group of people that just had too many meetings. They said, we said, we're throwing out every meeting and we're going to start from scratch and what meetings do we really need? How often do we need them? Do we need to be doing demos versus slide decks, right? So we stopped doing presentations within the team, which were slides. We said every, every, every high level um, planning meeting and overview meeting has to has hands on demos of real, real world code. 
So um, it's, it's really useful to think about what kind of communication you need across the team and, 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 and toy around with that and not just keep doing what you're always doing. So planning. So you know, starting from day one, we had this, let's do four month release cycles. And we'd sit down and say, what are we going to do for four months? Make up a plan, start working on it. But in a continuous delivery world, things change for, out from under you. Um, and also, you deploy the first iteration of some new feature. You get some customer feedback. They think it's crap, or they think it's really good. And that really changes your direction of what you want to do in the next month. So we actually found that you essentially cannot do detailed, long-range planning uh, in this world. What you need to do is have a, have a vision for what your goals are six months down the road, um, but not a detailed plan, um, and do detailed planning at, at the squad level um, and at a much smaller iteration level. So uh, as I said, some of the teams are using Kanban uh, for their day-to-day -day development work, which is, a, you can look it up if you haven't heard of it, um, development methodologies, kind of agile uh, or post-agile um, methodology. And one actually really important one for me was this idea of throwing out priorities. So we used to have this, you know, a lot of teams I'm sure have this, what's our priority one, priority two, priority three, or whatever you, however many buckets you have. Um, and what ends up happening, of course, everything becomes P1, right? Uh, everything is top priority. So that's useless for a developer. You're told, here's these six things that are all super important, go, right? That's really not helpful to a developer. So what we've done is we've essentially thrown the notion of priority in our culture, essentially, and said everything is about rank order. So instead of having priority buckets and, and where everything ends up being priority one is we say everything has to be ranked. We have a ranked list at the squad level and at the big organization level we have a higher level one, but it's all based on rank ordering. So if something new comes in that's super important, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the VP or the sales, whoever comes in with this super important thing has to come sit down with us, look at our list and say, where does it go, right? And they see what's going to get bumped by putting it in and, and where it should fit. And we can have that conversation with them in a transparent way instead of saying, this is super important, you've got to do this now without the context of what is the impact on that of the other plan items. So this notion of throwing out priorities and, and just living by a ranking um, at both the team and at the bigger organization level was really uh, interesting to us. And that, we found that, that, that sort of cultural shift important. Question. Yep. If you have several stakeholders mm -hmm. and they go in and look at this rank order, mm -hmm. and so you see a lot of items that is actually belonging to some other stakeholder. Right. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's absolutely valid. But having, being able to see that whole context, it, most, you know, the stakeholders are, you can have a rational discussion with them about those trade-offs, or you can say, let's pull in the, that, you know, those two stakeholders and get them together and we'll have a discussion between the three of us or something, right? Um, but being able to show that whole context to everyone um, and force that discussion on what the priorities are. I, I understand that, you know, six people come in with their super important thing and, Eventually, it's the development team is going to have to make that decision together with the product management. But um, you know, you can at least show them. Here's our explanation of why. You know, instead of just saying we're not getting to it, sorry, go away. Uh, we can say we're not getting to it, and, and here it is, here it is in our list, and this is why. And if you don't like it, you know, take it up the chain or whatever you want. Um, but at least they have that context to go by, right? It doesn't seem arbitrary to that stakeholder, right? And is that question? Yep. Right. So we, everyone in the world has access, or everyone in, in, in our company has access to enter things into, our, into the backlog. Um, you know, every, every consuming team, every salesperson, every wh whoever is involved with this is able to put things into our backlog. Um, at the level, each squad has this ranked list, and it's owned by the, we have um, a squad lead who's the technical lead of the squad and a management lead. And the t that pair of people is ultimately the owner of that ranking within the team. And then at the organization level, where the big, the big group, um, 
we have a we obviously have a director who has to be the one that makes that call, right? So um, everyone is allowed to play; they're all allowed to put their stuff in, but the you have to have an owner of the of the ranking, right? Uh, eventually, so you got to find whatever level makes sense to you. So, kind of a different topic now. So, uh, architecture was a very uh, important uh, point for us. So, we came into this with a bunch of existing technology. So, we had the Orion open source tools. We had uh, Jenkins for build. We had uh, Garrett for, for Git hosting. Uh, we threw them all together and got it out there in front of users. Um, but there was elements of the architecture of those things that made it really hard to do continuous delivery. Uh, some of those apps had, you know, 10 minutes of downtime to do an upgrade. And if you want to deliver once a month, 10 minutes is not a big deal. You know, if you want to deliver every day or five times a day, 10 minutes downtime is, is fatal. Um, so, um, actually, I think I got on to the next point. Um, but one of, the, one of the architectural principles that we're following here is, is avoiding those monolithic systems. Um, if you break your system down into smaller pieces, then naturally those smaller pieces are going to be easier to manage, easier to upgrade, uh, lower impacts if that individual service goes away. Um, so you, you'll find if you look up on microservices, you'll find lots of information out there on, on the principles behind it. Um, but that's something that there's, there are some people go overboard with microservices, you know, break things down into every little uh, endpoint in a, in a REST application has a separate service. Um, and then you have problems of orchestration between all these different services. So you kind of have to find a balance. But we found the general trend of breaking down monolithic systems into pieces uh, was a very important principle for us in being able to, to, to be able to do continuous delivery and to be able to, to, ma to manage working in that world. So, okay, now I'm on to the architecture point, uh, the, the sort of a detailed architecture point. This is, um, so my team in particular owned the Orion server. A uh, single instance of the web IDE, you know, we were running on WebSphere and it took about five minutes to do the deploys. Not too bad, again, depending on how often you deploy. Um, but also, if, if there was any kind of failure, basically had um, the picture looked, um, actually, I should have had a before picture. The picture looked like Apache uh, front end Orion disk, right? It's a very simple three tier architecture. If any one of those pieces goes down, you're screwed. So, uh, no redundancy several, every single piece was a point of failure where if that went down, the whole system went down. So what we've moved to over time, and this took a lot of rework in Orion in the open source project to make it happen, uh, was to be able to run in a, what's called an active passive configuration. So you have multiple instances of the server up at all times. Um, and if you want to do a deployment, you take down the passive server, you upgrade it, uh, then you switch uh, a load balancer in front to point to the passive, then you upgrade the primary and switch back. So that. That general pattern is called uh, the blue-green deploy or red-black deploy. You'll hear both, um, but it's a very common pattern for doing deployments without any downtime. So this is what we do now, and we are able to deploy with absolutely zero impact for users. So we can, and this has been really powerful for us because it takes away that decision you have to make where there's some critical fix, but we'd have to take the site down to fix it. Now we can just say there's a critical fix. Let's just release it right away. Um, and we had one uh, just last week, which was, um, or two weeks ago. So we'd released, everything was fine. The next day, a new version of Chrome came out, broke the layout of our Git page in Orion, where the commit button was off the side of the screen, basically, and you couldn't commit, right? Which is a fatal error, fatal usability bug brought on by a new version of Chrome. We had to get that fixed immediately, and we're able to, from seeing it to actually having the fix in production was about six hours, and that's not great, but it's way better than what we used to be, where that might take us a couple of days to get orchestrated. So, you know, we're hoping to get that further and further down. A lot of that time was our tests. We have uh, like over an hour, uh, an hour and a half of tests that run, so we have some limits there, but uh, we'd like to be able to get that time down where you can get a fix out really quickly if you can, if you need to. And that kind of architecture, the active passive architecture is really valuable for that. Okay, another aspect um, that we've done a lot of thinking about is design, and I think I touched on that a little bit this morning. Design, a lot of developers, the, the, they t tend to think of design as, um, as something you do at the end. Um, like design is, we implement it and it looks like crap, and then we add a designer and we make it pretty and then we ship it. Um, but you, it's not about that. It's not about making it look nice. It's about functionality, about user experience. So what we do, we're doing now 
um, to be able to do this kind of design, but in a continuous fashion, is we, we have designers in every squad uh, involved from day one, and we are starting from, we do user studies of the current product to see what the pain points are. We have designers involved in wireframing what a uh, resolution like to that might look like. We have playback reviews at the end with both the design and the developers to, to make sure we all agree on it. So it's something that we have to be doing constantly throughout the whole process and thinking about design, not just aesthetics, but functionality and user experience uh, all the time and basically have that as, as part of your, your development model where you're just always in a, in a design mode, not just sticking it on at the end. Because developers are pretty crappy designers for the most part, right? Like a lot of developers think they know how to make a UI um, and they can functionally make it, make it work, but it, 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 it's not just that, that it looks terrible, it's that um, it might have these fundamental usability, user experience bugs. And because the developer wrote it, they know how it works, so they just click around and they're happy. Um, but then you sit someone down who's never tried it and say, go try it, and you can see them flailing, right? You can see the pain point. Being able to, to be, have that mentality of thinking about that from day one uh, is important. Okay, I think I'm okay on time. So automation, uh, you know, I said this early on, automation is one of the most important principles of continuous delivery. And it's not just about automating uh, pieces, it's about automating everything. So, you know, you're all used to automating your builds, um, as I said before, and your tests, probably your unit tests, but you need to be automating everything. So the tool we happen to use for deployment is called Urban Code, um, which is a really useful tool for, we basically have, um, you, you won't be able to see the words, but we have all our different environments here, dev, QA, prod, and we have a few other uh, containerized ones for doing different experiments. Uh, so you pick the environment, you say, run this process, you know, um, do an active pass and switch, do an emergency restart, do a publish logs, do a deploy, um, and everything is automated. So you just pick the environment, pick the process, go, and it's fully uh, audited. So there's a history of every single th change that happened in the environment, when it happened, who authorized it, what steps were done, uh, what the resulting configuration was at the end. Um, so having that automation of, of everything, everything that touches the server, the production server is automated, and it's the exact same automation you run on your dev server as well, and having that auditability to know what happened when uh, is really important. And there are other packages out there, like we use Urban Code, but there's other, other um, deployment automation packages out there uh, that, that do a good job on it too. So testing, you know, developers often, you know, at least from my background, there's really two places you do, you have your tests. So at development time, in your IDE, you run tests as you're developing, and then you have some kind of build time unit tests where you run a bunch of tests in your build. So that's traditional and you need to be doing that, uh, but then you need to be doing a lot more tests to do continuous delivery, right? Because you want to be, you want to have the confidence to be able to push that button and know that it can go through the whole system uh, and get out to the users without, without being busted, right? Um, so, and that's at every level. So, you know, this is what our current testing pipeline looks like. So you developer does their tests manually, you run their unit tests. We do a Jenkins build, that unit tests again, just to make sure to keep everyone honest. Um, then we throw it up on a beta server, which again is exactly like the production server, um, but with a lot less traffic, of course, and, and less data. Um, we, and then we run a set of integration tests that are across the different systems. So we do a build of the web IDE, the unit tests only test the web IDE in isolation. You throw it up on the beta server and those integration tests test, you know, committing code from the web IDE and making sure it lands in Garrett, for example. That's one example of, a, of an integration test that we run. Um, and then we'd put it in a QA environment, which is QA means this is what we want to deploy to production. This is exactly across every system, the web ID, Git, Jenkins, whatever. This is exactly what we intend to deploy. And then we run a lot of tests. So we have the integration tests. Again, um, we run load testing, not every time, but we, we, we have a set of tests that we can run um, which simulate production server loads, uh, natural language testing. Um, we have these smoke tests, which are things that are just constantly a lot of these happen on deployment, but smoke tests are things that we have running just all the time on the QA and production servers. So every five minutes it'll wake up, make sure every system is alive, do some simple workflow like a commit and a push and make sure it worked, for example. Um, so those are things that we just have running on a timer all the time on, on the QA and production environments. Because things can break even when you're not deploying, right? Like you deployed everything, everything's static, no one's changing anything, 
something breaks, like it's the data center we're hosting on did some emergency restart of something, or you know, again, browser changes or whatever. So you need to be, it's not just when you deploy that you can break stuff, things can break any time, you need to have tests that are running all the time. Uh, and also we do uh, security penetration testing in the QA environment uh, to, look for, uh, to look for holes. So again, it's something you need to be, across every piece of your, your sort of development life cycle, you need to be thinking about what tests you need, um, you know, more's, the more the merrier, like, you know, make sure you're running as many tests as you can think of uh, when you see failures. Think about how could I test for that failure and where could I do that in my, in my, in my uh, pipeline. So together with automation, um, measurement is another one of the key principles for, uh, for continuous delivery. So, and this is actually something that's very exciting for, you know, for someone who's used to developing a desktop application, you sort of have a theory of what the user might want. You implement it, you wait a year, it gets released. Six months later, you get some feedback, then you can fix it and make it better, and then it's two years later, right? So it's a very slow process. When you're doing continuous delivery, you can be doing these kind of micro new features and do experiments on it all the time. So we do a lot of this now with the web IDE. So here's just one example. We did user studies that showed I don't pro probably a lot of you are familiar with user studies showed that people were confused by the fact that you have to stage and then commit, right, in Git. It's very confusing for a lot of people who think of just commit and push or whatever uh, the, the, uh, the metaphor was in there, where they came from. But this idea of having to go stage or git add and then commit was confusing. We found a lot of metrics were showing empty commits. Like people hit, made a change, went to the git view, hit commit, and they got an empty commit in the repository. So why are they doing this? What can we do? So we instrumented it, and we, we tried different approaches. We tried um, adorning the commit window with a big red box. You know, we tried different kind of indicators to show, hey, this commit is empty. Like, you probably don't want to do that. Um, that didn't really work. So we actually ended up putting up a message saying, when you hit commit, it pops up and says, there's no files in this commit. Are you sure? Um, and that actually dropped off the number of empty commits to almost zero. So it kind of solved the problem. But our, our designer had this theory like, maybe people don't want this uh, add commit distinction and they just want to just always commit all their changes when they hit the commit button. And a lot of us who are expert Git users are like, no, that's horrible. Like, that's not how Git works. And he's like, from a user experience point of view, they just want to commit their, their stuff. They don't really care about these mechanisms, right? So we said, fine, we'll run this experiment. If they hit on an empty and the commit's empty, we're going to put up a box saying, do you want us to always commit everything when you hit the commit button? Um, and we did that, and we found that some small set of users said, yeah, I like that feature, and they used it. So we instrumented how many people toggled that, how many people toggled it back off again. And the data set here was, I think, we have about 12,000 commit events a day, and about 170 uh, turned this on, or 0.07% found that useful. So. It told us this isn't something we're going to be putting in front of every user. We're not going to be sort of making that the default or offering that as the basic user experience. This is kind of a fringe set of users who, who, who don't want to have that separation and they want to just commit everything all the time. So we made a feature that's useful to some people. We measured it enough to know this isn't something we're going to give to everyone. This is something that's it's only interesting to a small set. So that's just one example. There's just tons of other examples of things that we've done where we've like had this theory, let's try it, let's instrument it, let's see what happens, and based on that feedback, then do something different. So another really valuable thing has been measuring failures. So measuring um, every, I think I mentioned in, the, in the, my short talk, every single client-side exception that occurs, we now track with Google Analytics um, uh, on, our, on, the, on the commercial version of it, and also on, on Orion Hub. And what that means is, you know, in the past, you'd actually get people enter bugzillas for some of these, but it would be kind of random, right? You might get someone enters one that is a freak exception that only happens once, in, uh, once a week. Um, but with this, we can go, you know, this one was a certain period. This particular exception, uncaught type error here on this line, happens 1,200 times. Well, there's a lot more bang for the buck for us to investigate that problem, right? So it helps us prioritize or rank, um, you know, what we're going to look at. And every week or two, we, we take a look at this dashboard, we see what the biggest exceptions are, and we fix those ones. And overall, it keeps our exception rate. When we started doing this, we had a huge drop off in our exception rate. And what we are seeing now is generally pretty low, but occasionally there'll be a spike. Some, someone, a developer, introduces a bug, 
uh, we immediately see in our metrics that this is causing a spike in exceptions. We address it, and we're back to a, a, lower, a lower number again. So that's really useful, having that kind of instrumentation. So that's the client side. On the server side, we do similar things with measuring your logs. Um, you can track every exception that happens in your log. This is you know, 400 errors over time. We can see there's a spike here, what happened at 10.04 p.m. Uh, we can dig into that. Um, this is a dashboard with, using Splunk, which is a log analysis tool. There's also open source ELK stack, which does very similar things with log, log monitoring and measuring. Um, I'm getting a little bit low on time, I'm gonna skip that. So marketing, from an open source project's point of view, this one was an interesting, you know, re annual releases or six month releases is a very natural point to do marketing, to do outreach. But when you're releasing every day or every week, um, when, do, like, people get fatigue, right? Like, how many people looked at the announcement of Chrome 42 coming out last week, right? Like, nobody. But when a new version of a browser used to come out, it was a big thing and there was a lot of media attention. But when you're continuously releasing, it's really hard to get attention. So that's something that we've struggled with and I don't think we've really solved, but it's, it's something you should be thinking about. Another one, just quickly, and I'm actually running out of time, continuous translation. So, um, you know, our, our products are translated into two dozen languages and we're constantly making changes to the UI and having to have them translated. We're actually using, um, this is experimental IBM Watson tool that does continuous translation, automated translation. And what it does is you actually feed it translations made by a human of uh, English to whatever, um, and it'll build up a corpus of, of what are the, what are the, I think is the translation for this term as opposed, because translation, get, doing good translation is very contextual, right? Um, you can't just take a word and, and, and map it to another language. You have to look at the whole context. So having, um, this is actually just an experimental tool, but it's something we're exploring um, or playing around with, being able to do those continuous translations. And actually, for any, I don't know what, where you guys come from, but uh, the German users in particular said it's unacceptable. Turn it off. Like, uh, you, your, your, your automatic translations are terrible. I, I want English instead. But for other languages, we found it pretty good success rate with the users. So just quickly, we're actually, our team is hiring uh, in, in Raleigh, Ottawa, and Toronto, and Bangalore. If anyone's interested, there's details there on how to contact us. Just wanted to let you know about that. We're growing, we're growing pretty fast. And that's about it. And I think the next speaker is coming in, so I'm out of time. Um, I think what I'll do is instead of taking questions, because I did go a little bit over time, I'll just go out in out the door there. And if anyone wants to come up and talk to me and ask questions, I'm happy to take your questions. So thank you very much.